Welcome to The Book Show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Novelist Susanna Moore's eighth novel, The Lost Wife, is an immersive story about a seminal and shameful moment in America's conquest of the West. Drawing partly from a true story, it brings to life a devastating Native American revolt and the women caught in the middle of the conflict. In the summer of 1855, Sarah Brinton abandons her husband and child to make the long and difficult journey from Rhode Island to Minnesota Territory, where she plans to reunite with a childhood friend. When the Sioux Uprising of 1862 erupts after the federal government never fulfills its promise of payments to the tribe, Sarah is captured but protected by the Sioux. Sarah sympathizes with her captors and slips into the gap between her two worlds. Susanna Moore is the author of several novels, including In the Cut, Sleeping Beauties, and The Whiteness of Bones. It is a great pleasure to welcome Susanna Moore to this week's book show. Susanna, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. What brought you to that summer of 1855? You know, friends have asked me that. Uh, It was during the pandemic. I was isolated, uh, and I was reading a lot, as always. And I, I came upon a book of, of female captivity uh, narratives and uh, was very interested in them. As you know, um, many of the women who were abducted died. Many were ransomed, and others decided to stay the most famous of them being Cynthia Parker, who some became the great chief Quinna Parker. But Sarah Wakefield got my attention because it was it was not unlike the others in the 17th and 18th century. It was it happened in 1862, quite late in um in, in the history of, of our country's relations with Native Americans. It was in the West, which was also unusual. And her story also had my attention because I wasn't sure she was telling the truth. Mm. Uh, And of course, I'm always interested in my books with my heroines. It's always an attempt to discover, reveal, hint at what is really going on. I'm fascinated by that notion of that she may not be telling the 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 truth. Were you setting out to find out what the truth was, or if she was indeed telling the truth, or just to tell her story? Uh, I did not set out to prove her untruthful. I, and there were there's a lot written about her, you know, essays about feminism, about captivity, uh, and there's a lot written about the the Sioux uprising of 1862, and and she plays a part in that. So. But no one in all of these um, uh, histories knew where she came from, except that they knew it was Rhode Island, but they knew nothing more than that. Why she was there, how she got there. Uh, And I, thanks to the internet, you know, which I often complain about, um, I (laughs) discovered that she was a bigamist, that she had left behind a husband and a small child and had made her way uh, to Minnesota territory in 1855. Um, what I had to make up, of course, was where, why was she going there? Why was she going to Minnesota territory? It's a rather eccentric, obscure um, uh, place for her to, 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 where she was going to hide, really, from this, from her husband and her family. So that part is, um, I made up, you know, it's a novel. The other thing that made me a little bit suspicious was that she did not, in what I had read about her and by her, seem particularly religious, but a lot of these narratives written by women were used as religious tracts, sermons, were published by the church, um, by um, the Quaker meeting houses, as a way to not only tell their stories, but to, about the triumph of the belief in in a Christian God. So when she wrote about that, 
it made me a little suspicious. I wasn't sure she wasn't using that as a, in a way, a cover for her own behavior. And, and also for fate, you know, she attributed a lot of the things that happened to her as the result of, you know, God, God's, God's behavior, so to speak. Susanna Moore is our guest. The new novel is The Lost Wife, and it's published by Knopf. Obviously, there is her story that you're looking at. Were there larger issues that you, there certainly seems that there are larger issues that you wanted to address and bring into her story as a as a way to look at them and analyze them. Yes, and that that is always difficult for a novelist because it's not our job to preach or to be even didactic or to convert or um, uh, to politicize a story. I mean, of course, it happens because the novelist, the writer, has a point of view. Inevitably, must have a point of view. But I was very intent on not. Uh, writing as if I were making a case for anyone or anything, although, of course, inevitably, I do. You know, I when I was worried that I might, I didn't want to offend anybody. And, and my editor, Sik Knopf, uh, said to me, well, it is the sort of white people who should be upset by your book, not Native Americans. So I don't know if that's happened. I don't think it has, but that was their reaction. What was your reaction to that reaction? I could see that, of course, it, it, why, why it would be um, offensive to some people, but you would have to have an extremely, what would I say, uh, uh, you would have to be sort of anti-historical to not acknowledge what our country has done to indigenous Native Americans. So to be offended that white people are portrayed as aggressors and um, murderers, you know, seems, seems extreme to me. Sarah in the novel of the uprising says, it all seemed very orderly and reasonable the way events in dreams seem to make sense. The novel does often have that dreamlike quality, it seemed to me. Well, I think when you are in, um, uh, you know, she was probably in shock. She was probably frightened. She was probably um, uh, mindful that, that, that she and her children could be killed at any moment. I think one way to get through that is to uh, separate oneself, detach oneself the way one is detached in dreams so that things do not seem, as I think I wrote, unreasonable. When you are when you were writing about her capture and end of about Chaska, and I guess how Sarah puts it is her good Indian, of, of what it is about that character and how you wanted that character to be portrayed? It was very difficult uh, in many ways to write about um, those characters who are Native Americans. I would never presume, as I have not presumed in my other books, um, to write from the point of view of a person, a culture, a uh, culture. Uh, a time uh, um, of which I, I really don't know as much as I should or need to. So it was difficult because, you know, I wasn't going to have him or his fellow Native Americans speak in, in uh, the way that Native Americans have spoke always in film, certainly in the, the movies of my childhood. Or And she remarks on that at one point. She actually says to her husband, sort of making fun of herself, ironically. Oh, they really do say how. Of course, I mean, ironically, when I, when I write it. I hope it's taken that way. In reference to Weiss being offended, um, I was very shocked last year when uh, a student at Brearley, which is a, a girl's school here in New York, um, complained that the captivity narrative of a woman called 
Mary Rowlandson, who was abducted in 1675 with her children, with her children, uh, was whiny was the word she used. Um, this is after she has been shot. Her child has been shot through the stomach and dies. And she is taken for six weeks through the woods from uh, Massachusetts to Canada. She thought it was um, an unpleasant story, you know, that, that portrayed um, Mary as being pathetic and rarely actually removed it from the syllabus, which really surprised me. Um, I, I hadn't thought that they would be, um, that they would do something like that. Did that impact how you thought about this story and and its portrayal? Well, if anything, because it made me angry. Yeah, it gave me courage. You know, it, it didn't it didn't cause me to back away or to uh, diminish what I was uh, writing about. Throughout your career, would you have always thought about courage to write something? as much as it seems that people think about now. How, how do you mean think about me now or just in general? In general, in, in the sense I basically mean about subjects. If you're writing about the Sioux or you're writing about the uprising of that there, that the, the, the courage of that, of a white woman writing that story that may not have even been a thought 30 years ago no you know what i i also what comes to mind when you ask me that is the is my book in the cut which right required a certain amount of courage but you know what is also the motivation besides a wish to be courageous um is is a kind of defiance i mean anger would be a little too strong but a refusal to accept the limits and restrictions that are put on one as not only a writer, but as a, a, a woman writer. I remember when I wrote In the Cut, I very much wanted to do something that traditionally was the uh, sort of genre and style used by, by male writers. So it's not only courage, but I suppose a kind of adolescent defiance. Too. And does that always rear its head throughout the writing or once you've made the decision, you've made the decision and you can move on with it? You mean the defiance or the courage or both? Both, yes. Well, I think it's always present. You know, there 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 are times when you are you are writing where you might or I am writing, I can only speak for myself, where I might uh think uh is this going too far? Is this too um, opinionated? Is this too personal? Is this too, is this accurate? You know, that's the other thing. Is this, is this real? Um, yes. Yeah, so it's always there. You mentioned in the cut, uh, which is about a New York City teacher who has an affair with a detective investigating murders in her neighborhood. What was it about that novel, because there are comparisons, uh, I think. You, I mean, you've brought them up. I, I saw them when I was reading this novel and, and uh, thought of my reading of In the Cut, of what it was about that novel and, as you said, what you were looking for stylistically and what you were looking for as a, as a writer. Well, before In the Cut, I had just written these, uh, I had just written three novels, very autobiographical about growing up in Hawaii, where I'm from, and my fa my mother, my family. I realized that I was seen. I had come to be seen as I don't think people use the term anymore. I'm happy to say, but as a as a as a woman's writer, you know, which meant that I wrote about flowers and children, and I resisted. I didn't like that idea. Again, the the defiance um, making itself. No, and I didn't. I didn't like that I was categorized like that. You know, in in general, for uh, being for women, and also I didn't think it was fair. I I, I didn't think that it, I was limited to writing novels for women. So it, it was very purposeful 
in the cut. You know, I really set out to write about the violence toward women and sex. Very important that I, I wanted to write about sex, which wasn't easy. And then, and then with this book, I think I think my writing has changed. I think I've become a little less. Uh, what would be the word? It's a little more refined, I think, a little maybe less defiant. I, I am less needful of, of making a point as I've, as I've grown older. So I think, oddly enough, this book, which is um, not about a gentle subject, is more gentle than, than earlier books. Does that make sense? It does make sense, and I'm I'm curious as to how you achieve that because this is this is a story of gory carnage that is committed by both sides, and this is a, a community that is that is shunned and 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 then traumatized, and I'm I'm curious as to how you were able to do that of of to have something. Because I feel that way, and there there is a uh, an understanding. The reader is with you in the sense that you do not have to be more, for want of a better term, graphic. I mean, that part was actually difficult because, to be fair-minded, one had to write about the atrocities and the violence and the mayhem uh, committed by the Sioux as well as by the white settlers and the United States Army. But if, if I also had to make Sarah, the, the subject of the book, sympathetic. So if the violence was too great, one would say as a reader, and I would ask, well, how does she put up with this? How can she, how can she accept this? Um, how can she identify with them and become, and become as intimate as she does become? So that, that was... That was an interesting dilemma. You know, so much of writing, people think that writing is about inspiration or, you know, the muse sitting with her legs crossed on the edge of your desk. <laughs> well, really, it's about problem solving. You know, I have this, but I need to get there. How do I do that? How, how do I make this clear and what makes sense? Makes sense. So it's it's there were a lot of problems to solve uh, with this book that uh, did not exist with the earlier books. There is so much there, and there's so much in the story, and each sentence packs so much. But the book itself is is slight. It's 192 pages, but there's so much there. And I, I was that always your intention to to keep it spare? Well, you know what happens is that uh, first of all, it's it's so filled with detail because one of the things um, that I like very much to do, much more than writing itself, is to do the research. And so I read for about two years before I began to write, taking notes, writing things down, um, and and. When I write, you know, I often don't know what I'm doing or where I'm going or how it's going to end. This, it was a little clearer because I had her um, her own recollections to guide me. But I'm very interested in the details, you know, even in, in the other books, the last two books, the last two novels. You know, what was it really like? What was what was what were they eating? What were they reading? Uh, how, what did women do when they menstruated? What were they wearing underpants? And what were they like as mothers? You know, that that interests me. And so I think the book is full of those, of the answers to those questions um, that I was asking. It is filled with those answers. And the, they often come out so they're very stark and almost instantly accepted because of the, again, for want of a better term, the uh, a bluntness that we're not used to often reading about such subjects. Well, I think probably not. Do you think that's true? I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe maybe it's, it's in nonfiction more than in fiction. I, I, I'm very intent 
not to make anything too sentimental, not to make it filled with nostalgia or, and certainly in this book, you can't find any assumptions that the past was easier or better. I mean, I, I really wanted to, to show what it would be like for a young woman to make her way west, even as late as 1855. There were trains, the trains stopped at the, on the western edge of Illinois, but um, the, it was still extremely difficult. If you think of the, of the Hollywood narrative of the cowboys and Indians of the white hats and the, and the black hats, I mean, it, even in the, in the novel, it's, you so describe what the situations are, again, free of that nostalgia, but also free of making anyone a true hero. No, I mean, I think, I think of Shaska as a hero and I think, I think of, I think she's a hero, mm -hmm. although in the end impotent because she's not able to um, save him or save the others. Uh, and I, some readers have found him, uh, her husband, Dr. Brinton, um, not sympathetic, which surprised me because I, I like him very much. But then I do tend to fall in love with my characters. <laughs> Does do you understand that, or I mean, do you realize that as you're writing it that you've that that you're falling for them? Yes, it takes a while. You know, it's not love at first sight. Um, it's <laughs> it, it's um, it's gradual, and I don't set out to do that. I don't set. I didn't set out to make uh, Sarah lovable or someone uh, with whom I would fall in love. I mean, that would be a disaster for a writer to do that. And, and I think, you know, oddly enough, in my earlier books, I think it's, it's a flaw. I think I, my characters are a little bit too likable, um, which makes me wince. I'm unable to read them again. So I, I, no, I don't, I don't, I don't set out to fall in love with her. Why, what is it about that of, of being too likable? Um, and I, I just think of you wincing and reading of, of what would cause that of, of if that is, if, if we feel connected to a character and, and are concerned about them in a way, basically fall for them the way you do. I think that in the in the early books, and perhaps this is this is shaming to admit because I was writing about myself, um, which I'm not doing in the later books. I I was I wanted a little bit too much uh, for the reader to identify and like the characters. I I'm I'm a little um, so they're a little too charming. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you would agree or if you saw it uh, when you were reading those books, but it was, they're a little too eager to please in some ways. And, and I do think this again is a, is a curious admission. I do think it reflects my own behavior, not as a writer. I think as I grew older, although um, I've always refused to let experience take precedence over the need to stay vulnerable or susceptible. I've tried very hard to do that. I think I have become, in my writing as well as in my life, less, um, less eager to please. Right. And, and so in those early novels, there was, because of the autobiographical nature, you wanted, and this seems perfectly reasonable and rational that you would want people to to like you and and to and to have a a connection with you but by the same token so now with your maturation as a writer as well as just as maturing adults we don't tend to care as much as we get older right i mean they're just there's... one way to put it also the earlier books are about I, I, both a child and then a young person, you know, very young. Right. So yes. 
But no, that's absolutely right, what you're saying. I no longer need as much. Of course, there's some, some of it still there. I mean, it would, be, it would be quite difficult if there were not just to exist. But no, I no longer um, need in my writing, certainly, for the reader to like me. I, I don't want him to dislike me, of course, but sure. I'm not I'm not as needful of that as I think I once was when I was in my 30s. For you now, what is the what's the perfect compliment that you can be given about your work? Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, people think I'm always writing about myself, and I suppose you could say that about most writers. I, I mean, I don't think I am. Um, the perfect compliment. I don't know how to answer that. Is there something that you're proud of that you would be happy if people noticed in your writing? I, I think, you know, because I am a secret nerd, um, <laughs> I think my seriousness, I, I, I would like my seriousness to be recognized. And I, I think it is. Um by some people and some critics, the, the 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 seriousness of thought that goes into it, and and of course um, work. Does that sound does that sound modest enough? That is absolutely modest enough. Susanna Moore is the author of *The Lost Wife*, a novel. It is published by Knopf. It is just brilliant and beautiful. Susanna, thank you so much for spending time with us. What a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Susanna Moore's new novel is The Lost Wife. It is published by Knopf. Our producer is Sarah LaDuke. Email us at book at wamc.org. The latest on national productions programming is available via the Airwaves newsletter. Sign up at wamc.org. Find us on social media at WAMC Radio. Book Marcus for next.